Today, the credit impulse hiccups in August. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics, one of the latest posts covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Both the RBA and APRA released their respective credit aggregates to the end of August today. And it's not running to script. Despite the rate cuts, some stronger buying signs in some housing markets, but on low, low volumes of course, and increased competition for loans, overall credit growth rate continues to decline. The RBA data over the rolling 12 months shows that credit growth has dropped to 2.9% compared with 4.5% just one year ago, and that's the slowest rate of growth since 2011. It peaked, by the way, in 2015 at 6.6%. Housing sector growth rose 3.1% over 12 months compared with 5.4% a year back and from a high of 7.4% back in the heady days of 2015. Within that, owner-occupied lending fell to 4.7% compared with 9.1% back in 2016, and investment lending rose to just 0.1% over 12 months compared with 10.8% back in May 2015. Business credit growth eased back to 3.4% annualised from 3.8% a year ago, and 7.4% back in 2016, reflecting weaker business confidence and concerns about the local and international economic outlook. Annual personal credit was down 3.4%, compared with the drop of 1.4% a year ago, and at its peak up 0.3% back in 2015. The more noisy one-month series shows that owner-occupied lending rose 0.3% compared with 0.9% in 2015. Investment lending fell 0.1% compared with a rise of 0.9% in 2015. And business credit rose 0.2%, way lower than the peaks of more than 1% back in 2015 and 2017. And personal credit fell 0.2% again in the month. Now, it's worth noting that the RBA makes seasonal adjustments to the data, though they did not disclose the basis of these adjustments, and this year has been far from typical. And they also say that historic levels and growth rates for the financial aggregates have been revised owing to the resubmission of data by some financial intermediaries, the reestimation of seasonal factors and the incorporation of securitization data the RBA credit aggregates measure credit provided by financial institutions operating domestically and they don't capture cross-border or non-intermediated lending. So, more noise in the data then. And talking of all that noise, the new APRA data is all over the shop. They started running a parallel series back in March and as we discussed last month, the proportion of investment loans in the stock data has risen as a result of all this. An overall credit stock for housing loans for the ADIs is running at 0.36% and appears to be rising since April. However, the swings between growth in investor and owner-occupied loans are massive and in opposite directions, and this is not a sign of good data collection in my view. The overall portfolio, market shares, indicated that CBA remains the largest lender for owner-occupied loans, with 26.1% share of the market, followed by Westpac at 21% and ANZ at 14.7%. In investment lending, Westpac remains a clear leader with 28.6% of all lending, followed by CBA at 24% and NAB at 17.5%. And the monthly movements tells an interesting story with CBA driving the largest growth in unoccupied loans at $2.3 billion, while dropping investment loans by a small amount. Westpac extended its investment loans by $0.6 billion and owner-occupied loans by $1.3 billion. And NAB and ANZ both lost investor share and EMI Bank lost owner-occupied and investor loans. Some other lenders picked some of those up.
Finally, our analysis of the proportion of individual bank portfolios of their investor loans, which of course is generally the more risky area in the downturn, shows that 44.9% of Westpac's portfolio is investment lending, worth $185 billion, compared with an ADI market average of 37.4%. NAB is at 43.4% and Macquarie at 43.7%. The Bank of Queensland is up there too at 42.7%. On the other hand, CBA is at 35.6% and ANZ at 35.3%. And data from our surveys suggests weakening demand for credit. And if this eventuates, it is quite possible recent home prices will be confirmed as a bear trap. While some down traders and more affluent households are indeed in the market, many other segments are sitting this one out. And remember that falling credit growth will translate to falling home prices. The math is that simple. And by the way, more rate cuts won't help much at all. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.